uh, it's a time of transition and change at Stonegate. And it's even a time of transition and change in the Robertson family, or at least significantly in the life of my uh, son, Kirod. Um, one of the only regrets that I have about going away this summer is that there are a couple of key events in Kirod's life that I missed out on. Um, one was his 13th birthday, and the other, perhaps even more significantly, was his debut here um, playing with a worship team uh, this morning. Um, this morning was the first chance that I got to see him live um, playing in front of uh, the front of the church. And it was interesting because as I was watching him, I was reflecting uh, on something that I've reflected on before, which is um, that when it comes to fathers and sons, although often, obviously, there are very great similarities, there also can be very significant differences between fathers and sons. Um, Kirod and I have a great deal in common. Um, but there are three fairly significant ways in which Kirod is markedly different from me. The first that I've alluded to is musical talent. Anyone who's worshipped in that part of the congregation, close enough to hear my voice, will tell you that I don't have any of that. Um, the second is, is that Kirod has a great deal of athletic ability and um, excels at team sports, and I don't. And the third is that Kirod is a quiet listener. Kirod much prefers listening to speaking is a man of few words and only chooses to speak when he's pretty sure that he has something helpful or useful to say. And I will leave it to you to arrive at your own conclusions <laughs> as to what that has to say about how similar or different he is from his father. Um, however, I take some consolation that um, there are other pairs of fathers and sons where this kind of thing takes place. And perhaps one of the reasons I was reflecting on it particularly is because um, it's a theme that has come up while I've made the preparations for the sermon, that I, the message that I'm sharing with you this morning. Um, and I think particularly of the relationship between two characters in the Bible, David and uh, one of his sons, the son who succeeded him as king of Israel, and that's Solomon. If you have even a passing familiarity with the, old story, uh, with the Old Testament stories, you know that David and Solomon are in many ways very different people. David is well known, um, I think, for being a man of action, a man of emotion, a man of, of impulse. Right? David is you know, the shepherd who slays the lion. He's the um, warrior who slays the giant armed with a sling and a few um, stones from the river. He's... Uh, the, the mighty um, military general who leads Saul's armies into victory after victory. Uh, he's this uh, emotional, um, action-oriented, uh, powerful um, leader among men. And then there's his son, Solomon. And for Solomon, it's in many ways very different. I mean, they're very similar. They both love the Lord a great deal. But Solomon um, is better known for being more steady, He's a builder. It's Solomon who builds up Israel as a, as a peaceful state. It's Solomon who, who builds the temple. Um, Solomon is more of a diplomat than he is a soldier, um, accomplishing a lot of the peace through alliances. And most of all, Solomon is known for one thing. He's known for his wisdom. And <clears throat> it's interesting to compare the writings that we have from these two men. From David, we get the Psalms. These, this book full of, of uh, passionate cries from the heart. And from Solomon, we get the practical wisdom and common sense and, uh, and the instructions of the book of Proverbs or the deep philosophical reflection of Ecclesiastes. And that's why um, I'm kind of excited to be sharing with you Psalm 16 this morning because Psalm 16 in, in some ways, allows David to kind of break the mold in terms of these characterizations. David wrote a lot of psalms. There are 150 psalms in the, uh, in the book of Psalms, and most scholars generally agree that he wrote probably close to half of them uh, himself, personally. 
But of all the Psalms that he wrote, Psalm 16, which we're going to look at today, is my favorite. And it's my favorite because of three things. It's my favorite because it works on three very specific levels. First of all, Psalm 16 is this wonderful laying out, this description of David's faith. In fact, uh, the name that um, I gave the sermon that I think shows up in the bulletin today is um, The Faith of David. It's a magnificent hymn of praise. In fact, some scholars have said that it's an almost creedal statement. It almost reads like a creed laying out what David's faith uh, is built on. And what we can see is that David's faith is based on three strong pillars. It's based on his uh, understanding, his um, awareness, his, uh, his appreciation for everything that God has done for him and done for the people of Israel in the past. It's based on an acute awareness that for him in his everyday life, in his every day, day by day, week by week, he is aware of God's presence in his life in the here and now. And his faith is based on this joyful anticipation of the future because he trusts God and that he knows that God's promises um, are solid, that they can be taken to the bank, that he's going to be okay because of his relationship with God. David's faith is anchored in his past and in the present and in the future. The second reason why I think Psalm 16 has so much to offer is because it is a wonderful prophecy about Jesus. It's a wonderful prophecy about Jesus Christ. It's about David. There's no doubt about that. David wrote it. The words that are spoken in this psalm come straight from David's heart and his mind and his faith. But they're also words about and by Jesus. Now, the whole of the Bible, we know, is a book about Christ. There have been people at different times who've tended to want to split the Old Testament and the New Testament apart and say the Old Testament is, uh, you know, is this old thing that kind of got replaced when Jesus came along, that Jesus shows up uh, in the Gospels, and now it's a whole new deal, there's a whole new thing going on. But that's not the case. The Bible is the story of God. It's the story of God's love for us. It's a story of what God has done for us. And Jesus is an integral part of that because he's been with God all along. The Father and the Son um, can't be separated from each other. Jesus was there at creation. Jesus will be there um, at the end. Jesus is all through. And we know that the Old Testament, because it's an account of God, is an account of Jesus. We're told this in several places. There's this wonderful episode um, set in the Gospels um, on the road to Emmaus. And most of you will remember the story. Jesus has uh, come. He's been persecuted. He's been arrested. He's been, um, uh, he's been crucified. <clears throat> and on the third day, the disciples go to the tomb, and when they get to the tomb, his body is gone, and they don't know what that means. And so a lot of them are really kind of confused by this. And two of them are walking to Emmaus, which is kind of the next town over from Jerusalem. And as they're walking along, this stranger falls into step with them and starts talking to them. Now, we know that the stranger is the risen Lord, but they don't. And because uh, Jesus, for a while, um, it suits his purposes to kind of hide his identity from them. But as they're walking along, they're kind of looking crestfallen, and he says, what gives? Why do you guys look so you know, down at the mouth? And they say, what, have you been under a rock? There's this terrible stuff that's happened in Jerusalem. There was this guy who came, and we thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was the Christ. We thought he was the Son of God. But they arrested him, and they crucified him, and now somebody's stolen his body. So I guess he wasn't the Messiah. And the stranger says to them, what, have you never read the scriptures? And as they walk along the road together, he opens up the whole of what we call the Old Testament. He opens up the scriptures to them. Now, when I say he opens them up, he wasn't carrying um, a pocket Bible with him. This is all from memory. But he takes them through, through the, 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 the 
Pentateuch through, through the first five books of the Bible. He takes them through Psalms and Proverbs and through the prophets. He takes them all through it and he says, see here, it says here that the Messiah would suffer. See here, it says that the Messiah would be persecuted. See here, it says that men would reject. He goes through and he points out how the whole thing is an unfolding of this story about, about what it was going to be like when the Messiah came and that all of these uh, problems, the suffering, the execution, were all predicted in the scriptures. And these guys are blown away. They go, this is amazing. And then it's only later they, they invite him to go to dinner with them and he breaks bread and they, they recognize who he is. But the whole, the whole of the scriptures are about Christ. And one place where you see this happening really acutely is in the Psalms. And we know for sure that it takes place in Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is a prophetic psalm And the reason that we know that is because the Apostle Peter tells us. If you remember the story of Pentecost, right? Jesus uh, has risen from the grave. He's with his disciples for 40 days or so, and then he ascends to heaven. But he tells them to wait, and they wait, and 10 days later, they're gathered together in this room, and uh, the Holy Spirit comes, and it comes upon them, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they speak in tongues. They're speaking in all of these different languages, and there are all these people who are gathered in Jerusalem um, from all over the world, and they hear this going on. They come to inquire about it, and Acts 2 tells us that Peter is prepared to give answer. Peter stands up and says, let me explain to you what's going on, and he delivers the first sermon of the church. And Acts tells us that, um, that by the time he's finished his sermon, by the time the day is done, 3,000 people are converted. But in that sermon, he quotes two or three passages of Scripture from what we call the Old Testament. He starts out by quoting the prophet Joel, but he reads this long segment from Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. Now, it's a part of the psalm that, that um, Nancy read just now where David says, I'm not afraid of the future. I'm not afraid of the grave. I'm not worried about the safety of my body because I know that uh, God is not going to abandon me to the grave. And what Peter says to the people who are listening is, sure, that was written by David, but it can't just be about David because David is still in the grave. David's grave is, you know, over here just outside of Jerusalem. I can take you there and show you where he's buried. No, these are David's words, but they are also a prophetic utterance of Christ's heart. Peter says that David, through prophetic inspiration, is speaking the very words that Christ might have had in his heart the night that he was praying at Gethsemane. These are the words of Christ. And that's how I know that Psalm 16 operates on this second, completely um, higher level. And the third reason why I love this psalm is because it has so much for us, for you and me. It's been a very important psalm uh, at key junctures in my life. um, And I think it has a lot to teach us about faith. So let's take a look at it. We're going to start with Psalm 16, verses 1 to 4, which says, Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. In this, in these few verses, David um, has three little hidden gems of understanding about the nature of faith, about what faith is. And let me just quickly identify what those three uh, kind of starting points are. The first thing is that faith is a choice. Faith is a choice that we make. It's a decision that we make, right? There are other options, right? He says, there are other gods out there. 
Now, in David's time, that was very acutely real. Um, in the society surrounding uh, Israel, um, there were all these other peoples who worshipped all of these false gods. They had idols and statues and altars and, and uh, sacrificial rituals. Um, and the people of Israel themselves would occasionally give in and worship these other gods. And what David says is, there are choices, there are other gods you can worship. And I think for us, it's no less true. I think that um, we're gathered here in this building to worship the one true God, but I think that there's all kinds of gods, alternative gods out there for us to worship. I think that there uh, is career, and I think that there's money, and I think that there's status, and I think that there's success. I think there's all kinds of, uh, uh, there's commercial uh, consumption. There's all kinds of other gods, other ways we can frame our life, other um, paradigms around which we can build who we are and what we think our lives are. But what David says is, You have a choice, and you should choose to worship God. You should choose faith. He says, those who worship other gods are just going to have more and more trouble. Their troubles are going to increase. Now, that's not that those who worship God are without troubles. But the question is, who will you go to? David says very pointedly, you are my Lord. You are my Lord, I will not worship these other gods. The second thing that David illustrates in these verses is that faith is an all-encompassing thing. Faith is an, is an all-in or nothing thing. Um, those of you who had occasion to watch the, um, the World Cup uh, a while back will notice that there was a, a major athletic shoe sponsor who was sponsoring the Olympics. We saw their commercials all the time. Uh, not the Olympics, but the uh, World Cup. We saw their their commercials all the time, and their commercial slogan, their marketing slogan was, all in or nothing. Well, that's what faith is. It's all in or nothing. There's this wonderful verse where David says, now David has a life with lots of blessing in it. There's lots of challenge and suffering, but there's all kinds of good stuff in David's life. But what David says is, there isn't one good thing in my life that doesn't come from God. He says, apart from you, Lord, I have no good thing. You're all of my life. It isn't as if I have my faith. I have my main life over here, which has its own joys and blessings and good stuff in it. And then over here, I have my faith life, and it has its good stuff in it. David says, it's all from God. Apart from you, he says, I have no good thing. And the third thing that David Uh, slips into these verses is that faith is a thing that is done in community. There's this wonderful verse. Now, I have an old beat-up 1984 NIV um, that translates it in a particular way. Uh, The copies of the Bible you have in front of you may word it slightly differently. But the, the phrase in here is, as for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. These are Christ's words. Christ takes delight in you. He takes delight in us. He takes delight in those who believe in him. He takes delight in the community of faith. Okay. I mentioned before that David, in essence, reveals three pillars of his faith, and I want to briefly take a look at each of them they're, they're laid out very beautifully in this psalm, kind of one after the other. And the first shows up in verses 5 and 6. Take a look at this. Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I can tell you, friends, I already know this is what I want on my tombstone. This is what I want as my epitaph. This is what I want read um, when I get laid to rest. What a wonderful statement of the depth of, of uh, David's 
sense that who he is, where he is, where his life is, where he's come from, the whole thing, his whole identity is wrapped up in God. He says, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You've made my lot secure. He says, what my life is comes from you, and because it comes from you, I'm content with it. And what it reveals is that he's aware, very aware of how much God has done for him. And in fact, what David has in this passage, what he has, and it's something that I think he invites us to have as an aspect of our faith, is appreciation for what God the Father has done for us understanding of how much God has done for us out of his love. Now the second pillar of David's faith I think is laid out in the following verses. Okay? David's faith isn't just a static thing which says God's done good stuff for us in the past so that's what I'm going to cling to, that's what I'm going to work with. David has a faith that's based today. It's based in the right now. Listen to what he says in verses 7 to 9. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. David is leading a life where he's aware that God is there for him to counsel him, to guide him, to instruct him, to um, admonish him, to direct him, to encourage him, to give him hope, to protect him, to shield him, to challenge him. God is there in the everyday of David's life. He says, I will praise the God who counsels me. In other psalms, um, in laments, David and other psalmists write about um, the despair that can come at night. Right? I, uh, a year or so ago, I preached on Psalm 77, um, remembering our songs in the night, and we talked about how the night is this time of deep, dark despair uh, for people sometimes. But David contrasts that in this psalm. He says, not only do I have this sense of God's presence and availability in my life during the day, but even at night, when I'm alone and vulnerable and scared and lonely and afraid, even then my heart instructs me. Even then, God is available to me. I will not be shaken. And it's not just that that it's, it's... there for him as a resource, but it affects who he is. He says, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. What David has, and which I think he invites us to have, is awareness of the presence of God's Holy Spirit. He's aware of the presence of God's Holy Spirit. And finally, In the last verses, we learn that David looks back with appreciation and gratitude. He lives in the moment with awareness, and he looks forward with anticipation and joy to the future. Listen uh, to these final verses. This is Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This passage works on all three of those levels that I spoke about. For David, in his life, 
right? This is about confidence that God isn't going to abandon his people, that God isn't going to stop caring, that God isn't going to stop looking after him, right? He doesn't fear the future. He doesn't even fear death. Now, David is the king of Israel, and the people of Israel built this promise, their understanding of God's promises around their understanding that the Messiah was coming. David and his people believed that God was sending a Messiah, his son, the Christ, and that in that act of love and redemption and salvation lay their future. And so for David, David can say with confidence God isn't going to abandon me to the grave because I know, I know that I have his promise. I have the promise of the Messiah. I have the promise of the coming full kingdom of God. For Jesus, Jesus has the confidence of his relationship with his Father. Remember that Peter told us that these verses, verses 8 to 11, were a reference to Jesus. And if you'll imagine with me Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane, right? It's it's the day before his his crucifixion. He's had the Last Supper with his disciples. And now he's gone out to pray to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he, he goes on a while and then he asks three of his disciples, Peter's one of them, to go with him uh, to pray. And, he, and then he finally ends up praying alone. Now Jesus knows what's coming. He knows that what lies ahead for him in the next 24 hours is arrest and trial and beating and torture and a slow, painful, excruciating death hanging on the cross. Jesus, the man, knows that those things are coming for him in the next 24 hours. And imagine him praying these words as Peter does. Imagine Christ at Gethsemane praying, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And for us, what I think these verses have the potential to offer, right, is the confidence about our own future, the confidence in God's love for us, our confidence in God's promises to us, the promise of eternal life and the anticipation that Christ is coming again to redeem all things and to restore all things and to bring us all together into this uh, perfect, fulfilled kingdom of God. David has something, and Christ, of course, had it, but David has something that he invites us to have, right? And that is anticipation of the coming God, anticipation of the coming of the Son of God. In conclusion, now my children complain that I put the in conclusion part about 15 minutes from the end of the sermon and it ends up confusing them. We actually are only a couple of minutes from the end. (coughs) David lays out in this psalm this wonderful model for what faith should be. And this model is a model that the church has used for 2,000 years in its understanding of what faith looks like. Because we have these three things. We have uh, appreciation of what God the Father has done. We have awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. We have anticipation of the coming of the Son of God. Well, there are three words which David doesn't use but which are sitting right there in front of us and which the church has seen in these. The source 
of what God the Father has done for us is the question, right? God has done a lot for David and a lot for Israel and a lot for his people, a lot for us. And why has he done this? What is the source of all of this blessing from God? And the answer is, it's his love for us. So the first pillar of David's faith is his understanding of the love of God. In the second part, David talks about his awareness of God's presence, his um, encouragement, his comfort, his uh, guidance, his instruction, his protection. Well, for a long time, we in the church have used a particular word to describe all of those activities, and we have referred to it as the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And finally, we have this confidence. The church has this confidence about the future. Confidence that we have access to eternal life. Confidence that God is not going to abandon us to the grave. Confidence that we're loved by God. And where that confidence comes from isn't from some philosophical system or through our living up to some laws or our our um, meeting certain administrative requirements. All of it comes to us through the grace of Christ's incarnation and sacrifice and death and resurrection for us. The basis for our joyful anticipation of the future is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament and the New Testament are pretty closely related. The faith that David had is the same faith that we embrace today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you that you are the same God to us that you were to David. We thank you, Lord, that we have access to your story through your word, that we have access to you through the Holy Spirit, that we have access to your community through the church. We thank you, Lord, that we have access to you and to eternal life through your blood and your death and your resurrection and your life and your love. And we thank you for these things. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.